We're sitting here in the Doherty room. Doherty, Walter Doherty J. Room. Doherty, yeah. And I'm sitting here with Forrest Ackerman. Nice to meet you. Hi, likewise. A very interesting place you've got here. I uh, can't even begin to name the, the stuff I've seen today. Well, it was originally the home of the movie actor John Hall. He was kind of a poor man's Tarzan, Raymar oh, of yeah? the jungle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very beautiful home. We, we took a tour of that as well. What got you interested? What got you started uh, in building a collection as immense as this? Well, way back in 1922, when I was five and a half years old, I'd, I'd picked the right pair of maternal grandparents, and they took me to a movie called One Glorious Day. And I think for me, it was One Glorious Night. It really turned me on to the fascination of fantasy. It had a curious little creature called Eck in it. It was a kind of an ectoplasmic uh, uh, boy of about eight years old. and. Uh, my grandparents were capable of taking me to as many as seven films in a single day. We could have seen more, but in, in those days, uh, the time of a movie was sometimes taken up by uh, eight acts of vaudeville. Mm -hmm. But after the experience with uh, little ectoplasmic Eck, I found that I looked forward to films, uh, The Man of a Thousand Faces, Lon Chaney mm -hmm. uh, playing in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and uh, The Phantom of the Opera, and The Monster, and The Unknown, and so on. and and, uh, well, I liked all kind of movies and still do. I guess I see about a thousand a year now. But uh, back then I particularly gravitated toward the, the Lon Chaney movies and the Thief of Baghdad, and particularly when I was catapulted a hundred years into the future with Metropolis. Mm -hmm. That really fascinated me. I recently saw the film for the 77th time, still <laughs> trying to make up my mind whether I like it or not. You know? <laughs> We could um, give kind of a Siskel and Ebert review of it or something like that. What, what are some of the highlights, the uh, outstanding highlights of your collection that mean the most to well, you? Well, there are approximately 300,000 things in it. The mayor sent four librarians around one day, and after they picked their eyeballs up off the floor and poked <laughs> them back in their, their sockets, they went to work, and they told me I have 40,000 books. I have uh, 250 different editions of Frankenstein and 250 different Draculas, and uh, one of the most important Frankensteins is the Bride of Frankenstein, which was inscribed to me by the late Elsa Lanchester, who mm -hmm. played the role. And then uh, Dracula-wise, I have the first edition signed by Bram Stoker, who wrote it, and Bela Lugosi, who immortalized the role and Christopher Lee and John Carradine and Vincent Price and all kind of people who played Dracula. And then in magazines, it was October 1926. Well, this is an anniversary, isn't it, right here in October, mm -hmm. uh, that I picked up, uh, or rather it sort of picked me up, a magazine called Amazing Stories just jumped off the news <laughs> and grabbed hold of me and said, take me home, little boy, you will <laughs> love me. And and one day in the distant year of 1988, you will find yourself on something called television being uh, <laughs> being interviewed. So uh, since that October 1926 Amazing Stories meant so much to me, before he died, I went to the artist, Frank R. Paul, who was the pioneer science of fiction artist from about 1926 to 36. He dominated the magazines. And he redrew the cover for me. And it originally it had a a tall crustacean creature about two or three times as tall as a man and there was uh, the the hero of the story but in this case the artist uh, uh, took the hero out put me in his place and so there I am immortalized with the magazine that began it all for me so that's one of my treasures and then uh, in Metropolis I became enamored back in 19 27 of the robot tricks, the, the female mm -hmm. uh, automaton, which I've named Ultima Futura Automaton. The original was probably blown to bits in the Blitz of Berlin. Nobody mm -hmm. knows what became of it, but uh, a couple of chaps got busy, spent a year and a half and 600 hours and recreated her for me. So uh, when the big quake comes, I think uh, a couple. I'll run out with uh, the painting under one hand and the robot lady under the <laughs> other, <laughs> and make sure they survive. Yeah. Another thrilling thing I got just uh, more or less recently. I say I have over 250 Frankenstein's. I'm, I'm still lacking the very first edition back in 1818, which is real tough to get because it wasn't a single book. It was in three volumes. Mm. Sometimes you'll find the first or the last or the middle, but uh, 
to get all three is about a fifteen thousand dollar proposition mm. if you can ever find them however i did get hold of a book lately that was inscribed by mary shelley the teenager who created frankenstein so at least i have her autograph well, that's great uh, do you have any heroes uh, you know as as children we we have heroes in the in the on the screen etc do you still have any heroes that stand oh out i i sure do uh, i guess above all i admired lon shaney senior and uh, then when the the horror screen began to to talk or groan or <laughs> uh, go grr. Mm -hmm. I uh, became enamored of Boris Karloff. I found when you took off the mask of the monster that there was there was uh, Santa Claus behind it. <laughs> he, he was just as gentle a gentleman as you could imagine. And I found two others, uh, namely uh, Peter Cushing. They call him Saint Peter, and mm -hmm. uh, with good reason. And uh, Vincent Price, he's just really a, a remarkable gentleman. So those those three are great heroes of of mine. I was fortunate to befriend Bela Lugosi in the last three years of his life, mm -hmm. uh, wearing his Dracula <laughs> ring. Uh, I was at his funeral. He was buried in one of his capes, and uh, his son has one, and I have the the final cape. Just last last night. Uh, from two to four o'clock in the morning, I was uh, up in the uh, observatory wearing Lugosi's cape and doing part in a picture I'm presently playing in called My Lovely Monster. It's been keeping you busy, I understand. Nothing but busy, you know. I, I uh, if if I could be fed intravenously, I think I could <laughs> go on 25 hours a day and 366 days a year. I really never weary of it all. Mm. It's uh, life has been kind of fortunately fun and games for me when i was 15 years old i was corresponding with 116 boys and one girl uh, girls interested in fantasy were about as rare as dinosaurs teeth mm -hmm. <laughs> back then but uh, one day uh, when i was 15 i had a very immodest thought i thought to myself Fory ackerman i think you are more interested in science fiction than anybody else on earth mm -hmm. And I think uh, by now I've checked it out. I'm not only more interested than anybody in the world, but to several other worlds that I have visited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just had a collect call from Mars a little while That's ago. That's right, I yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you about, this is off the track a little bit. I didn't tell you about this, but mm -hmm. uh, in the movie Plan 9, we were talking about Plan 9 from outer space earlier. Mm -hmm. Was Bella Lugosi was actually in... That well, at the they start had, of production was yeah. Either. They had shot a, just a little little footage, and you can tell the difference between the the real Lugosi and the uh, chiropractor who took over because <laughs> he plays it constantly with the right. the uh, cape up. So about all you ever see are his eyes and his forehead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a lot of people know that, but it is. Mm -hmm. a, they did still finish the movie even after mm -hmm. he passed on. Mm -hmm. Uh, what? How do you feel about the direction that horror and sci-fi is taking today with the new uh, up-and-coming directors? By the way, may I point out, you said the magic word uh, 35 years ago before you were born, I'm sure. I was riding around in the automobile and, and uh, had the radio on and hi-fi was mentioned. And since science fiction had been on the tip of my tongue ever mm. since 1926, I stuck out my tongue, I looked at the mirror, and there tattooed on the end of my tongue was <laughs> sci-fi. <laughs> which you created that Which term. I created, yeah, back in 1954. Mm. And I've lived to, to find it proliferated all around the world. They use it almost exclusively in Hungary and in Finland. It's even reached, I've seen it in print in China and... Uh, Czechoslovakia, it's just been, and of course, if I had a penny for every time I yeah. see it every day of my life, <laughs> you know, say, I'd, you be, still get the I'd be independently jets. wealthy and I would create a museum to house all this. <laughs> Have you had any interest in uh, anybody wanting to house all this material? Oh or? my goodness, yes. Uh, nine years ago, I offered it freely to the city of Los Angeles. I was just willing to walk away from my life and and let posterity have it if uh, they'd just show me the empty shelves and let me be curator for the rest of my life. The city tried unsuccessfully for five years though to find a place to house it and uh, then up in Monterey they were quite keen to have it. They uh, attract a million seven hundred thousand people a year up mm -hmm. there to their oceanarium and they felt if they had my collection three hundred thousand 
things that nobody would dare set foot in America without <laughs> coming to Monterey to see it. Right. And uh, we had a real meeting of minds. We're all gung-ho to go, go, go. But Mother Nature got in the act and uh, pulled the rug out from under us. Uh, when the people got back, they checked it out, and they found, unfortunately, the city was within 5% of zeroing out on their water level. <laughs> so they put a 10-year moratorium on any new buildings because they wouldn't have the water. Then I, I went from no water to more water than I had dreamed of, the Queen Mary, <laughs> which is uh, docked down at uh, Long Beach, and uh, they have 60,000 square feet of emptiness, a couple of uh, decks there, and for about six months their, their thought was that uh, they would love to have it. They were very yeah. flattering. They said they thought 50% of the attraction would be the collection and the other 50% would be me, and mm -hmm. they'd get me on the Johnny Carson show and send me around the world publicizing it. But that fell through, and and then uh, Houston, Texas has got in the act, and Beaumont, Texas, and uh, Cleveland, and uh, right now Danbury, uh, Connecticut has an empty uh, castle back there, and they're thinking about be nice to have it there. And then Philadelphia has got in the act, and uh, and the city of L.A. Uh, in 1992, uh, they say they'll have a new library downtown. How would I like a wing in it? So that is kind of a far-off thought there. Uh, Disney for a whole year was um, considering down between Epcot and Disney World mm -hmm. of uh, creating Forrest J. Ackerman's or Mr. Science Fiction's uh, Fantastic Universe. And well, maybe we'll find a place in Covina somewhere. Well, it'll be <laughs> convenient in Covina. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's a nice little pun there. Uh, I was going to ask you, maybe if you could elaborate, what what does Halloween uh, mean to you? What is this? Is this a special time of the year for you? Well, Halloween is kind of a, a rebirth for me. I become a a reborn uh, monster. Uh, I'm discovered by uh, two on the town and I on L.A. and uh, and the newspapers just had a, a three-page write-up in the uh, Herald Express on Friday, and. Uh, I'm generally torn between about half a dozen things I can do on, on Halloween itself. My friend Ray Bradbury, I edited and published his first story back in uh, 1938, and uh, Ray often uh, rents a theater and, and shows some old classic like The Old Dark House or The Island of Lost Souls, and uh, so I'd be invited to to attend his showing, or the Count Dracula has some kind of a do. Uh, uh, one rare occasion I was at home here in the <laughs> Acker Mansion, and uh, dozens of screaming little kitties, which are down <laughs> below, we have what is called Grizzly Land, son of Disneyland, and uh, it's all full of uh, skeletons and flying saucer man and all sorts of horrid things that uh, little kids love to yell and scream about so on the rare occasion I'm home why I answer the door and show people about but uh, generally I'm say uh, off somewhere or other at a Halloween party or uh, this uh, time I'll be up at the uh, observatory this is the uh, year that Mars and Earth are getting as close together as they will be for many years and it's the 50-year anniversary of Orson Welles scaring the pants off the, mm -hmm. the country, panicking everybody with uh, his broadcast of the War of the Worlds. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be giving a talk for an hour about Mars, not the, the real Mars that we have discovered it to be, uh, but the fanciful Mars of the last hundred years that H.G. Wells and uh, Ray Bradbury and uh, all the great... Uh, visionaries the way they saw Mars. It's tomorrow night that you'll be speaking at, at the uh, observatory? Sunday night just before uh, Halloween, yes. It's 7 o'clock up at the observatory. I'll be giving an hour talk about the, the fanciful visions of Mars in both literature and movies. And that will be open to the general public? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. It sounds yeah, very they're, they're going to have. Uh, they're also for the kids. They're passing out Mars pan candy, <laughs> and I believe there'll be a uh, cake with uh, Mars mellow uh, <laughs> icing on it. <laughs> oh, Rob's going to love this. <laughs> we have a. I have a letter here that I I 
found in your collection lying in one of your bookcases yes, uh -huh. from a 14 year old um, how many years ago did you receive this and can you elaborate on who this 14 year old oh, well, was essentially? yes well uh, you'd be surprised by the name says I'm 14 years of age been writing as far back as I can remember and submitting manuscripts the last couple of years while I was editing a magazine at the time called uh, Spacemen mm -hmm. and um, we uh, encouraged uh, kids to send in stories uh, for what was called the O. Henry's Comet uh, section. And uh, so little Stephen King uh, <laughs> was the, the author of this letter. Well, I, I'm sure glad you, you took time out from your busy schedule to uh, talk pleasure. to us people from Covina. And I know that uh, there's um, too much to see in, in one day here. It'll probably uh, uh, take about a week or a month to see everything you have here. Well, some, some years ago, and this is before I'd been to Transylvania or Hong Kong or behind the Iron Curtain, uh, and I uh, hadn't been in about 25 movies yet, but the um, University of California came to me and they wanted my memoir, so I thought I'd better be very systematic. I'll go through the alphabet A for Asimov and eventually up to Z for Zelazny or I'll, I'll leave somebody out. So after 34 hours of dictation and two million words, I wasn't through the B's yet. <laughs> So they'll be writing so. your, or you'll be writing your memoirs into the 2000, year 2000 or mm -hmm. longer than that. Yeah, the, I'm just a month away from my 72nd birthday. At my 70th, I had 400 friends from all around the world. They came from Sweden and Japan and and uh, China and Mexico and Romania and um, say 400 on my 70th, so I figure on my 75th maybe I'll have 500 <laughs> friends, and and on my 100th birthday maybe a thousand. I have to rent the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Well, thank you very much. It's you been bet. a pleasure. This has been a great day. Likewise. Thank you. You bet. Bye bye.